tap, tap, tap. Is this thing on? Yes, that's right. It's on. And that's right. This is the Q&A on Joyrider TV. Yes, my name's Joe. This is Joyrider TV. And we are going to be talking about some hot catamaran sailing questions in the next hour or so. So if you're lucky enough to be here live, then um, if you've got any burning questions that you would like to get off your chest or uh, anything about boat handling, boat maintenance, which type of boat would be right for you, uh, anything to do with your boat or anything else probably, uh, then just stick it in the live chat. If you're not here um, live and you're watching this later on, don't worry because if you have got a big question that you need answering or a small one, all you need to do is put it in the comments section below and I will put your question into the preloaded questions for next week. And uh, there we are. Uh, now, incidentally, next week, we might be in for a time change for the Q&A. So um, I will certainly let you know what the crack is there. So hello. Uh, that was hello. So uh, just checking in with everybody who's checking in. Uh, hello to Christian. Uh, hello to Thorn G. Uh, thanks for giving me a minute. Um, I think I was just a minute late today. Uh, hello to Ryan. Um, if you're in the live chat and you could see Ryan has got green writing, you may be thinking, why has Ryan got green writing and these amazing custom MOGs he can use? That is because Ryan is a channel member. Yes, channel membership is available to everybody, but it will cost you a little bit. Um, anyway, um, all right, Christian says, uh, can we whip up a Joe enters the arena song and video with the appropriate lights and fireworks? Yes, I think that would be quite appropriate. Um, hello to Philip. Great to have you on board. Um, OK, this is with us as well uh, down in somewhere, Galveston Bay, Texas. Nice to have you with us, Chris. Uh, all right. Fawn G says, I beware of me. I have a new question. Great stuff. We've got Stefan on board. Good afternoon. Love this time slot, by the way. Yeah, um, I'm, I'll am i try to keep the Q&A in this time slot for next week, but um, that will be the day before our season starts here um, at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, Lefkus, Greece, which will probably mean the following week I am going to have to change to the earlier time slot. Apologies for that, but I don't really have much choice um, because the day job is still interfering with the YouTube, which um, we have to put that right. I think, um, yeah, there we go. Christian says, all right, question. If you had a policy of never hiking out on the trapeze, how much speed slash VMG would you be sacrificing? This is a great, a great question, Christian. Um, it's not easy to say. Um, so how much slower would you go if you didn't go on the trapeze? Well, on Hobie 16, I did do some testing. I think about two years ago, I did make a video of... Um, how fast can I go single-handed, strong wind with no trapeze on the 16? And I think I arced it up to about, uh, I, I'm sort of guessing here, but I'm thinking I got it up to just under 21 knots, which is really um, shoveling it along quite nicely. Whereas on the trapeze in the same conditions, I would expect to be going at um, a shade over 22 knots personally uh, on a good day where I'm wearing the right shoes. So um, I would say you're probably going to lose. Um, what's that in percent? If it was if it was one knot, 
uh, on 10, that'd be 10%. So 5%, yeah, perhaps between 5 and 10% of boat speed um, you would lose by not trapezing. Uh, you can still have an absolutely great sail without using the trapeze. If you're not going to use the trapeze and you were going to sail solo, a good way of, of still pinning her down is take someone with you. Uh, two people on the boat is going to pin it down much better than one if you're not using the trapeze. But of course, if you're not using the trapeze in a light wind, then you're going to sacrifice less boat speed. So up to about 15 knots, then it the number, the percentage of boat speed that you would sacrifice will be much less. That's what I think anyway. All right. So um, we've got Zach on board in Toledo or Toledo, Toledo, uh, Ohio, Ohio. Um, wet, cloudy and chilly today. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, we've got pretty good quality sunshine here in Greece now. And that is looking to push through right until when the season starts uh, the weekend after this one uh, for us. Yeah, long days in the sun at the moment. That is for sure. Uh, I'd like to say hello to Joyrider channel member Jens, who's just tuning in. Great to have you with us, Jens. All right, we've got Max on board. Uh, while we're saying holidays, regular visitor uh, from Rosenheim, Germany. Just back from Lake Simsi, had a fun time on my Taipan 4.9. Great stuff. All right, we've got RJ Fleet on board in cold and windy Minnesota. <laughs> God, it's good that we're getting weather in from all these different places around the world. Well, in America anyway. Which from here is around the world, effectively. All right, Chris says, biggest question when are you making a Texas tour stop? Yeah, I'm looking forward to the Texas dates on the world tour because um, you know, I do love a barbecue and I've heard in Texas they are bigger and better. Um, if, you do, if you disagree, put it in the comments below, of course. Um, very good. Christian says 21 knots is impressive, but... Was that on a point of, oh yeah, this is a good point actually, specific point of sale. What about going upwind? Yeah, so that 21 knots would be um, doing the usual um, Joyrider TV speed run where wind, where we start off here. Sorry, boat's pointing the wrong way. Um, start off here. And basically, every time there's enough pressure for the hull to lift, same technology as if you want the boat to go as fast as possible. Every time the windward hull lifts, we ease the sheet. I saw this on one of the forums, the um, Hobie Cat forums, actually, on Facebook this week, uh, where there's, I can't remember his name, chap in Australia, was asking, how do you sail as fast as possible? Well, every time the windward hull lifts, start off on a reach. When the windward hull lifts, that means there's enough wind or pressure to go faster. If we transfer that, um, what would you call it? That um, energy, which is lifting the hull, transfer that hull lifting energy into speed by turning further downwind. But very important is when you hull lifts, you want to turn downwind. If you just turn downwind without easing any sheet, you're going to stick the nose in. Yes, you are. Um, unless you're sailing a boat like a modified Prindle 19 or something with loads of volume in the front. If you're sailing a boat with less volume, you've turned downwind slightly. You are going to stick the nose in unless you ease a bit of sheet at the same time. Ideally, you'd ease a bit of main sheet and jib sheet simultaneously, if you can, uh, turn downwind. And then once you're there, 
sheet in again. And what you're aiming to do to go as fast as possible is to get as far downwind as possible with the windward hull just out of the water. That is how you're going to sail as fast as possible. But what Christian is saying, what about if you were not trapezing going upwind? Then I think as a percentage, you would be uh, losing more boat speed. Because here, going downwind to go fast, um, you're trying to keep that hull in the air. So by not trapezing, you actually, you can just go deeper downwind and perhaps go almost as fast. Whereas upwind, where all the pressure is trying to lift the hull um, and you're not pinning it down by using the trapeze, I would say you probably lose about, 10% at least of boat speed, maybe even more. But to be honest, I haven't done any testing on this specifically, but perhaps I should. And perhaps I will. So there we go. Hope that helps there, Christian. All right. Kurosh is on board. Wow. It's been a long time since Kurosh has joined us in the live Q&A. Great to have you with us, Kurosh. What are the advantages of a tapered mast versus a standard mast this is a very good question um it is in fact a question that hasn't been asked before and um here it is so just so that you know what we're talking about this would be a let's call this a standard mast section where the mast section is the same width or thickness all the way along its length. So this would be like on most production boats, all F-18s, um, Hobie 16s, Dart 18s, um, all production boats. And in fact, I would wait. I don't even, I don't know what the NACRA 17 uses, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was a, uh, a uh, a section like this whereas what you can have is a tapered mast where the mast is much thinner at the top uh, and thicker at the bottom so what are the advantages to having a tapered mast well i think the first advantage which is the most obvious. I'm sort of thinking on my feet here um, to some degree is the first thing that would be uh, the difference is the tapered mast would be much lighter because we've got a lot less material at the top uh, than we do at the bottom. So this is going to be a, a really good design point as it is. Um, and then next good point of the tapered mast is because it's thinner at the top, the top's going to bend more easily, which means when we pull the downhaul on, it's going to have a much greater effect. So it's kind of going to be like sailing with a softer mast. If um, So with a softer mast, uh, when you pull the downhaul on, less downhaul will have a bigger effect. So we're going to have more control on the shape of our sail with a tapered mast. Um, and then possibly the third thing with a tapered mast is it's going to have um, a faster gust response, which means when the gust hits it, it's going to bend with the gust. So almost like acting more like suspension. And then when that gust goes, it's going to come back more quickly than the straight section like that. So these all sound like very positive uh, reasons for having a tapered mast. So you may ask why. I think the only boats which definitely, as far as I know, use the tapered mast um, as standard is the Tornado and the A-Class. Um, I don't even know if the A-Class used the tapered mast 
these days. But um, the reason they're not standard on all types of boat is the cost. A tapered mast is going to cost much more to produce than the straight section, where in the factory they can just measure out the length of section, uh, get a grinder, chop, put some ends on, fittings done, it's out the factory door. Whereas a tapered mast, much more involved in the manufacturer at manufacture and therefore much more expensive. There we go. I think that was a pretty good answer, actually. So thanks very much, Kurosh. All right. So um, we've got a weather report coming in from Ireland. It's shite, wet, windy and cold. Uh, this is from Philip. Thank you very much, Philip, for the update. Um, Chris says, anybody said Texas barbecue isn't the best, is uneducated. Laugh out loud. All right. We've got Joachim on board from Argentina, I believe. I hope that's right. How, how are you starting out that season? Yes. Yeah, so the season is kicking off next weekend. So not tomorrow, but the week after. Um, at the moment, you may have noticed there's a lack of anything coming out from Joyrider TV. That is because all day, every day, non-stop is spent on the uh, preparations for the season in the newly rebuilt Wild Wind Sailing Holidays. If you want to see what's going on, this is going to be a quick uh, uh, plug, by the way. But um, I have been making some behind the scenes videos, which I've been putting on Patreon and out for the Joyrider Sailing Club channel, Joyrider TV channel members. So if you want to get these behind the scenes video, uh, sign up to be a Joyrider TV channel member or sign up on Patreon. Um, and this it's people who sign up on these things, which is keeping the channel going. If it wasn't for you guys, I would have stopped a long time ago because as you may guess, a lot of time goes into making these videos. And it's um, the fact that I am at the end of this season, hoping to retire from the day job and just making videos. Uh, it's you guys that are making that uh, possible. So thanks very much to everybody who's been supporting the channel. So anyway, back to the live chat. All right, so we've got Angel on board. Greetings from Mexico. I'm terrified of drilling the hulls to put the epoxy resin in. I prefer to continue sailing with the delaminations of my Hobie 14 because I feel the hulls are very safe. Yeah, I think if you feel that the hulls are safe and you don't um, perhaps trust your skills with or your experience with doing a fairly um, significant hull strengthening job, I would, as long as you're not sailing in big waves or um, massive amounts of wind, I think you should just carry on as you are rather than risking um, damaging your boat so you can't use it and hang out until you can take your boat to a professional boat builder who would then be able to do the job very easily and quite quickly. Um, but, you know, with any sort of intrusive repair stuff, which involves drilling holes in your boat, um, if you're not extremely confident or experienced using um, these uh, resins um, and fiberglass, things like that, then it's probably best to seek the help of a professional or someone at your boat club who's got experience doing those repairs rather than risking uh, not being able to go out sailing at all. So I think that's quite wise there, Angel. All right, we've got John on board, who is another Texan saying hello. Great to have you with us. All right. Uh, Ryan says, remember to hit that like button upon entry. Yes, your entry fee today 
when you join this live Q&A session is just to uh, hit the like button. That's really good for this video getting promoted to more people who could uh, really do with knowing all this stuff that I'm saying, although I haven't really answered many questions just yet. All right, we've got Gaz Gaz on board in Essex, England. Great to have you with us, Gaz Gaz. I've watched all your videos and I am out this weekend on my Hobie 15. Thanks for all the info. And if you see me drifting by your place, give us a wave. Great stuff. All right, very exciting times for you there, Gaz Gaz. I hope it all goes well. And I hope the forecast treats you as it should. Uh, not too much wind, I hope, or horizontal rain, which is uh, one of those things uh, that we have experienced on the east coast of England. Chris says, have you got rum in that bottle? It's pretty strong, whatever it is. Anyway, we are now going to dive in to the first preloaded question, or actually this is a preloaded hunt for parts. Uh, so we've got Dan, who is in Illinois, USA. Um, he is looking for a pair. I think it's a pair. It might just be one, but he's looking for ti Hobie Tiger dagger boards. If you're in the USA and either you have or you know of somebody who is selling Hobie Tiger dagger boards, put it in the live chat or no, not the live chat. Put it in the comments. If it's in the live chat, I'll, I'll, um, it won't work quite as well for me. Um, but put it in the comments section below, which might only be available once the live has finished. And then I'll put you in charge with Dan in charge, in touch with Dan and Dan get some dagger boards for his tiger and get back out on the water. Now, I've, of course, got quite a stash of Hobie Tiger dagger boards uh, just around the back, but uh, postage from Greece to the USA for dagger boards, these are pretty heavy things, is going to be steep. There we go. That was number one. All right. Christian says, I have a 3D model of a Hobie that a volunteer made for my now postponed Race to Alaska, but um, bid, sorry. I'd love to share the video from it. Yeah, great stuff. Um, if anything like that, if you um, send me video clips to um, to uh, the usual email address, totaljoyrider at icloud.com, then I'll put it in the next show us your cat video. Nice. All right. So Jens is in with a good question about the self-tacking jib system on the Hobie Tiger. It's a little bit description necessary to understand. I want to ask and I hope it will become clear. All right. Bear with us, guys, please. When you go on a hot reach for high speed with a Hobie 16, you put the jib traveler all the way out. Uh, and make it flat or a bit loose. The jib on the Hobie Tiger with the self-tacking jib is not is always not to bring that far out, I guess. And second, always you got a bit of a strange curve in the jib. So I'm thinking, does the classic jib system, here we go, like on the 16 with the spinnaker bag, have an advantage when you go on a hot reach with the jib traveller far out for a flat, loose jib. You think it's more forgiving or maybe faster? All right, this is a good question. So let's just uh, put that into simple terms. So what Jens is asking is going for a two-sail reach, like a very fast reach on a boat doesn't have to be a tiger any boat with a self-tacking jib would it actually be beneficial um to have a, a regular non-self-tacking jib system so that you can travel the jib out further so 
let's just, if this is our front beam, quite big, there's the mast. Self tacking, we've got a track here. So if you if you didn't know about self tacking jib, it really does do what the name suggests. It takes care of the tacking and jibing. You don't have to change it. Uh, the jib sits on this. The clue of the jib where the sheets attach go onto this a car on this track. So when you change sides, the wind just blows the jib over to the new side, and you don't have to do anything. Um, and then the sheets end up, you don't need to worry about how the sheet actually works, but the sheet ends up going from here and generally into the end of the, the front beam like this with the cleats. These are cleats, by the way, like there. Um, so you don't even have to... Um, play one jib sheet or the other it's all continuous so you can use the jib sheet that's closer to you this is phase one so if we now can we see this yes we can there's the mast a standard jib system would be just with let's really make it very simple we have the jib sheets going from here and they come back onto the trampoline like this. Now, I would say um, the, act, the, the jib on the Tiger is pretty small, and it's not the most powerful jib in the world. The, the design of these types of boat is to sail an upwind, downwind course primarily, which is why it hasn't got such a big jib. Uh, it's quite a small, high-aspect jib, which makes it very efficient for sailing upwind. And then downwind, of course, you are using the spinnaker to give you that extra power to make the boat fast downwind. So it's not designed with these fast reaches in mind. But that's not to say that you shouldn't be going on fast reaches. The, out of all of the F-18s, I would say the Tiger two sail reaches this is controversial, by the way, better than any other F-18. What? Is that serious? Yes, the Hobie Tiger is a two-sail reach monster. It just charges. You, If you put the dagger boards up when it's windy, put the dagger boards up to the downwind position and just drive it like you stole it, stand on the back, play the main sheet a lot, travel out a bit, uh, to get it to the sweet spot, then it absolutely flies. And I would say the sail shape of the jib is not a massive consideration. If you could put the, um, on the self tacking system, we do have the option to move where the car stops. Like we have got a line that restricts it going out further than we want it to. If it's windy, I would get it all the way out to the end. Um, because, um, however, on a boat with a traditional jib traveler system, um, you will, if, if this is the end of the beam, you would be able to get your jib traveler further out. But on these fast reaches, having the jib dead flat isn't, what we're looking for quite so much because we do want a bit of curve in the jib because that is going to give us more power and more drive it will act more like a bit of a spinnaker when we are sending it downwind so sail shape wise i wouldn't run i wouldn't worry either way between the self tacking or the traditional jib systems when you're sending it and you're trying to go as fast as possible. However, what I would say is that if you really want your boat to be a sending it machine for two sail reaches, 
um, like if you were absolutely going to modify your tiger just to do upwind sailing and two sail reaches, um, take all of the spinnaker gear off the boat for a start and then sail with the traditional jib system. Now, this is not because of the sail shape, but this is so the crew can have the jib sheet and be right at the back of the boat. With the self-tacking jib system, it is difficult to rig it so that the sheet's long enough to allow the crew to come all the way to the back of the boat. So um, that, I would say, is the advantage of having the traditional jib system on a tiger or something similar for sailing two sail reaches. Now, of course, um, yeah, it is nice for the crew to have the jib. Not only is it something to hold on to, uh, but also it's nice for them to be able to play the jib and contribute to the boat speed that is going on. Now, on these two sail reaches, you may ask, this wasn't part of the question, but you may ask, well, can't you just pass the main sheet to the crew, get them doing that, and um, then they don't need to have the jib sheet anyway. They can have that. Helm can hang on to the traveller line. Now, personally, I prefer to have the main sheet and the stick so that um, then it's so much easier to synchronise the, you know, how I was saying before with soon as the hull flies, you want to bear away sheet out a bit, then sheet in again to synchronize that bear away, ease the main sheet out and pull it in again. Um, but perhaps if you're sailing the boat and you haven't got big arms, um, then it might be better for the crew to have the main sheet and you'll just have to really be big on the communications. So gust comes, hull comes up in the air, uh mate helm says to the to the um to the crew ease ease uh meaning let it out or dump not dump ease ease means let's it, let it out gently dump would mean let it out a lot because we're going to capsize so hull comes up ease ease as the main eases you bear away and then the helm would say right sheet sheet so crew sheets in both arms perhaps uh more efficient so there we go. I hope that helps, Jens. Um, I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but um, yeah, that is what I would say about the jib system on the Hobie Tiger or F-18 for reaching. All right, we've got Romy Rom Locked. Mm. Great to have you with us. I'm not sure if I'm off topic or not, but I'm going to look at a Hobie 14. Great stuff. What are the main things to look at before purchase? It's going to be my first sailboat. I've been watching your videos, learning great stuff. I'm really pleased for you. This is actually a life-changing thing that you are about to do by purchasing your first sailboat. Um, you are basically getting the invitation to a whole new world of good times out on the water. So let's hope that it's good. Um, right. First thing you want to look at um, when going to look at a boat that you might buy is the hulls. Um, the reason we look at the hulls first is because the hulls are the main part of the boat. And if the hulls are no good, then it's going to you're just going to be sort of um, up against it, trying to get the hulls um, up to a standard where, or maybe replacing the hulls. They are the main part of the boat. So the hulls should be in decent condition. So um, what we're doing is we're checking for softness in the hulls. So starting on uh, the fore deck, that is the deck of the boat, just forwards of the front beam, and we're going to do kind of like CPR on the hulls where we just take the, the palm of your hand, push down on that foredeck. If it moves a very small amount and the boat isn't very expensive, we can accept it.
But if it moves a lot, perhaps making a kind of crunching noise uh, um, and that movement extends to a, a large area of the hull, then that unfortunately, unless the boat is very cheap and you know about um, fiberglass repairs or you've got a friend who can do it for you, then that would be a let's not buy this boat kind of feature. That softness means that um, the, the fiberglass has basically separated or delaminated inside, which means it's not strong anymore. And the deck of the boat is what stops the hull from folding in half because the wires that hold the mast up at the front they go onto the decks of the boat or so that part of the boat is supported by the decks. And if they're not strong, you'll snap your boat in half. Important to have stiff decks. So that's number one on the hulls. Number two, same thing, but on the sides of the hulls. Look for any soft bits inside and outside. Number three on the hulls. Check the pylons where God, I've got a bit tight today. I have to. So the pylons are the bits on a Hobie 14 that stick out where the beams go on, like this. This is the pylon. And what you want to do with the pylons is get somebody to lift one of the bows of the boat. So lift one of the bows at the front of the boat. And while that's being lifted, just have a look at where the pylon goes into the hull. And if the pylon moves differently to the hull, like if you can see the pylon moving inside the hull, this is definitely, I would say, a don't buy it. Uh, thing because to repair that means it's a massive repair it that needs to be solid inside the hull um so if there's movement let's do it in a different color if there's movement here let's just draw the rest of the the hull just so we really know where we are if there's movement here or here on either side more likely to be on the front one, then don't buy it because that boat is not seaworthy and it's going to fail big time. Um, movement, however, here is very normal. Um, with an older boat, it's going to move more there, um, but it's completely normal and you shouldn't worry about that too much. Um, also, with the hulls, Check the fittings where the rudders go. Um, just check that they're not broken or cracked or anything like that. Um, and then just have a look at the bottom of the hulls because the boat might have been run up the beach a lot. Um, and sometimes that can actually be, if the owner hasn't looked at that, it could actually be worn where there's not a lot of fiberglass left on the bottom of the boat. So well worth having a look at that. So that is what I would look at with the hulls. Then after the hulls, um, I would, what would I look at after the hulls? Then just look at the, the front beam. Just underneath, if this is the front beam, like that is really bent actually. Um, we that doesn't make any sense at all. Apologies. All right. Anyway, it's, it's, it's the same again. Um, so that's the front beam. We're just looking at onto the front of the boat here. Just have a look under the front beam um, where the mast sits here and just look for any signs of cracking there. Um, if there are signs of cracking, um, they vary. If it's just like a hairline crack 
and your plan isn't to go out and send the boat in massive amounts of wind, which if it's your first boat is unlikely, then that's okay if the boat isn't very expensive. But if it's a big crack there, then uh, that is obviously not a strong point. So avoid uh, because the front beam, again, is a quite a major part of the boat. Um, then look at the mast. There's not that much which would uh, go wrong with the mast. But what you can do is um, firstly look up the mast. Is it straight? Uh, you can straighten a bent mast, but it's nice not to have to. Um, and then just with the fittings that are at the bottom of the mast, just see if there's any, if a boat's been sailed in the sea, this is the only way this is going to work. Look to see if there's any kind of salty residue that's come out from those fittings. If there is, that might mean that the mast has had water inside, which might mean uh, that it leaks. That I would give it a, um, a mild avoid point. And then the rest of it, like you've got the sails. Um, sails can be replaced reasonably inexpensively. Like you could probably get a, a used Hobie 14 mainsail for about $250 or something. So it's not too bad. Um, the trampoline. Now, you can really transform an old boat into a new boat by putting a new trampoline on it. And having done some research, I saw Salt City Sailing uh, USA, you can get a brand new trampoline. This was for a 16, but I'm sure a 14 would be about the same for under $300. When you put a new trampoline on your boat, it really makes your boat feel like a totally different boat. So it's probably one of, it's a better, in my opinion, it's a better facelift to give to your boat than anything else is a new trampoline if it's looking a bit tired. And then after that, um, the rigging, if it's an older boat, it's unlikely that it's had new rigging put on it for quite a long time. So the rigging is what we... Yeah, so trampoline isn't going on the list because I think that is a very worthy thing to replace um, because of this facelift. Whereas the rigging, so if we've got our um, our boat here, there's the mast. Now the rigging are is the wires that hold the mast up. So you've got the ones on the side called the shrouds, one at the front, the forestay, which attaches to the bridle wires. Those uh, five wires, they haven't been replaced recently. You want to replace those because what you don't want to happen is have your mast fall down. So there we go. I think that's plenty to be going on with. Um, I hope that helps. And I hope that it works out with buying your first sailing boat. I'm very excited for you, as I'm sure you can tell. At this point, 43.30, I'm just going to take a short commercial break. Okay, and we're back. All right, so we got Mr. Tony KP in Denmark. Um, it might uh, nice weather in Denmark. Great stuff. I think maybe if Greece is nice, Denmark's nice. Maybe that means the whole of Europe's doing okay at the moment for weather. Who knows? All right, Thorn G. Question: If I want to moor on a buoy, uh, so tie the boat up to a buoy. I take down the jib, of course, but what do I do with the main sheet? Detach it, loosen it, or give it a good tension. All right, yeah. So if you were going to leave your boat on a um, on a mooring, yeah. So if you've got the ability to roll the jib, this is going to be very nice. Um, what you want to make sure is that your boat is moored from the front. So. Um, what um 
a good way to do that would be to um can i even draw this yes i can all right here's the hole there's the bridle wire and there's the mast and there's the boy which would go on a rope like that so a good uh what we want to do is make sure that when we're mooring a boat um a catamaran especially is that the pull is coming from the front it's it seems very obvious to just moor the boat by attaching the mooring to the dolphin striker or the capsized writing line straight to the front beam but if you do that the boat will be all over the place it'll be really moving around like this all of the time and it will make you very nervous indeed so what to do yes uh Get rid of the jib if you can. If, if you're sailing a boat with a fully battened jib like a Hobie 16, then what we find here, because we moor our boats all the time, is as long as you make the jib sheets completely loose, it's okay to leave the jib. Because it's fully battened, it means it's not going to flap. And as long as it's completely loose, it's not going to do anything too bad to the boat but if you've either got a if you've got a jib without any battens in or if you've got a mylar jib like on a, a tornado for example then yes you want to take that down ideally it is going to be difficult to drop the jib on the water um because of where it is it's going to be very high up you're going to have to do some sort of acrobatic thing uh, standing on the bow of the boat, leaning in towards the jib. Uh, it will be very easy to drop shackles. So you'll have to come up with a scheme of how you're going to do that. But if the wind's light, then you could just leave it. Just make sure it's loose. Um, then the main sail, yes, detach the main sheet. That's why we um, put on our main sheets here, snap shackles rather than regular shackles because they're very quick and easy to take off uh, without the risk of dropping a pin in the water. Um, yes, yeah, so take the main sheet off and most importantly with the mainsail is completely loosen th the downhaul because as we know, when we pull the downhaul on, if we look from above, the sail gets all of its shape and it's like switching the boat on, putting the downhaul on. When you let the downhaul off, the sail is going to have no shape and it will just sit there re really nicely on a mooring. Um, so that's what I would do with the sails. Then for the actual, how would you tie the boat up? Um, what we do here, I keep saying what we do here. The reason for that is because that's what we do here is at the top of the bridle wires, we have a rope loop like that, which goes, uh, which stays at the top of the bridle wires. And then what we do is from the boy, the line would come up here and it has a clip on it, a carabiner, and that will go through that loop and clip onto the bridle wire at the top there. That's really good because it means the boat's going to sit perfectly into the wind. And the reason we have it at the top rather than the bottom of the bridle wire is to stop it from hitting the hull, which could cause damage. Now, if you haven't got um, a, mo a long mooring with a clip, I'd still recommend if you are going to put your boat on a mooring or use an anchor, put a rope loop round the forestay at the bottom so then it will hang over the bridle wire. Um, and then what you could do, let's say you've got a blue capsized writing line, take your blue capsized writing line. This is the same if you're getting towed as well. Um, put it through the loop and then attach that to the mooring boy. There we go, mooring, very good. Thanks for the question there, Fawn G. All right. So Ryan says, sail it like you stole it. This is going to be my saying 
This weekend, uh, Ryan says, my favorite thing about being a channel member is this sick custom honey cat MOG. Very nice indeed. Um, Christian says, we are here for the chat, the tangents. Well, that's just as well. Otherwise, it might uh, be a bit much. Right. We've got Eric on board. I had a big, long paragraph that I almost wrote, wrote for Romy. Thank you for answering. Wrinkles on the sides, run. Great stuff. All right. Ryan says off to work as always. Uh, but he's going to be driving it like he stole it on the getaway this weekend. Uh, if you didn't know, the Hobie Getaway Speed Stick Challenge is on. And um, it's looking, the speed stick at the moment is looking pretty thin for getaways. So if you sail a getaway, go out sailing this weekend, take a GPS, let me know how fast you went, get on the speed stick. Chances are you'll be the fastest getaway at the moment. Very good. Right, we've got Cuck Solly on board. Great to have you with us. From Zero to Foil is here too. Have a look at the sale too. Yeah, so yeah, do, do have a look at the sales, of course. Yeah, I would say we're buying a used boat. If the sale has got a lot of repairs on it or if the cloth looks extremely faded, it really depends on how much the boat is being sold for. If it's not a particularly expensive boat, like if it's like $600 or less, you can't expect it to be coming with a nice, um, good condition set of sails or just main sail. Um, but if the sail is very old and it's not been washed after it's been used, got salt on it, then it is likely that if you were to capsize, fall into the sail, you'd go straight through it. So that is potentially. Uh, an expense that could come up. All right. Philip says, I spent loads on new parts, new boom, new wings, new trampoline, new wing tarps, and a full rudder setup, including rudders, all unused, just 20 years old, 950 euros, and new whirlwind sails on order for the Hobie 18. Wow, that's pretty. 950 euros that is that's pretty good all right so Romy says I will definitely keep you posted and continue to tune in thanks again thanks to Eric for starting a reply yeah great stuff all right so Philip's got a Hobie 18 formula or also known as an 18 SX nice stuff all right we've got Matt on board great to have you with us Matt um I have to choose between watching the Q&A and working. All right. That's a tough one. Um, can you watch the, oh, if you, if you're kind of having to work for yourself or something where you've got to be, um, yeah, disciplined to do your work, then I should keep the Q&A on and um, just try to do something that you can do whilst being distracted uh, with a bit of catamaran chat. There we go. Incidentally, Matt just um, got a very good custom T-shirt from TotalJoyRider.com. Uh, you see that one there? Oh, yeah. See this one here? Oh, yeah. A great way of improving your boat speed or getting better results at an event is by having a custom T-shirt. If you and your crew turn up to an event wearing matching custom T-shirts, what do you think the rest of the the fleet is going to think? Oh, whoa, you know, fear. Um, we're going to have to look out for them. So if you want to get a custom T-shirt, uh, send me an email and um, and then it will be with you before too long. I think Matt's one arrived after uh, it was much less than a week after the order was confirmed. After. So what I do... You email me, say I want a T-shirt that says um, Spanner Jim on the side with a picture of me boat with the colours of the sails and the sail numbers. Um, 
I'll do the design for you, send it back to you, so that then you could say, yes, I love it. Or you are very welcome to say, I don't like that at all. Could you change everything? And then I go, okay, I'll change everything, send that to you. And then when you say, yes, I love it, then um, I send the instructions to the printer. The printer then prints it onto a T-shirt or a hoodie or anything else, sends it to you. So when you turn up to that event, you look deadly. Oh, yeah. Now, if I had a bit more space, I could show you the back of this one. Oh. That's just a little sneak there. Um, yeah, so there we go. That's it. But there's a lot of off the peg items at totaljoyrider.com as well. And it's a great way of supporting the channel. Thank you very much. So I've got to put these bits of advertising in um, just to help pay the bills. All right. Philip says sales are 2K. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah, sales can be expensive, but you. You can always check Facebook Marketplace, put in used Hobie 14 main sale, and you might be able to find one for a good price. All right, Matt's running dual monitors. Fun on the left, work on the right. Yep, I'm running dual monitors, actually. One just with a bit of a warm glow of light. This is why the lighting is so good. One where I can see your questions. All right. Pylock 17. Hello. Welcome to the live chat. Great to have you with us. He sails a Bimair F16, very similar to the Viper. It's really hard to handle in breeze when sailing, reaching with a spinnaker. Do you know how to avoid the boat to pitch, not to, to pitch in the water, stick the nose in when hammering it, let's say hammering it with the spinnaker up? OK, so the big trick here to keep the nose out is actually there's a couple of tricks, but the main two is, well, most important fundamental thing to avoid sticking the nose in when you're sailing fast with a spinnaker is to sail as fast as possible. It might seem counterintuitive. But by sailing faster, it means there's more pressure trying to stick the nose in. Uh, speed is your friend. Oh, yes. So the way we're going to do this is, firstly, in fact, and most importantly, make sure that the spinnaker is never in too tight. If the spinnaker is ever in too tight, this is really going to slow the boat down a lot. And when the boat slows down a lot, it means there is more pressure in the sails trying to capsize you. So by sailing faster, there's less pressure trying to make the boat capsize. So it's less likely to stick the nose in. So the way we distinct determine that with the spinnaker is we let the sheet out. When the front edge of the sail starts to curl, then we pull it back in a little bit and we keep repeating that. So let the spinnaker out. It curls, bring it back in. It straightens again. We keep doing that, making sure that the spinnaker is never in too tight. All right. Number two, moving back down the boat. Um, you could say, what about the jib? Don't worry too much about the jib. When you start going fast, um, the jib will need to be in quite tight. So if when you turn from upwind to downwind, you, you um, didn't let the jib out, it's not going to contribute to you sticking the nose in. Not on an F-16, not on an F-18, on a tornado, maybe. All right. So next thing to look at is the downhaul. When you've turned downwind, uh, let the downhaul off a little bit, maybe about halfway. Um, this just takes some of the compression out of the mast, making it less likely to break the mast. Small detail. Um, 
Then coming down, back down the boat a bit further, very important, is put the dagger boards up. I've heard in certain classes, the trend these days is to leave the dagger boards down, even sailing downwind with the spinnaker in strong wind. But I would say don't leave them down. What we want to do when we're sailing downwind is, sorry, I'm just drawing. Um, all right, so if this is the rudder, what we want to do is when we're sailing downwind, we want to have the same amount of dagger board as we have got rudder in the water. So this is going to mean having the dagger board lifted about halfway, depending on which type of boat, uh, how long your dagger board is. But what this does is this reduces the friction from the dagger board which is causing drag, slowing the boat down, which isn't working with our speed is your friend um, motto. But what it's also doing, if we've got too much dagger board down. So when we've got too much dagger board down, we're getting a load of pressure from lower down because we're going fast. So this is pressure. And when we get pressure there, if we think about it. What's that going to do if the boat is pivoting here? If we push there, this is going to come down. We don't want that to come down. So put your dagger boards up and we will reduce some of that pitching. And then one of the biggest things that we can do, which is really going to help to keep the nose out, is get your crew out on the trapeze and back foot right back here and front foot as far back as they can go but so that they're still stable and when the crew is right back here it is pretty easy to keep the bows out the final thing is you want to reduce the amount that you're steering as much as possible so don't um, don't head up too much. Hull comes out of the air, then you have to bear away again. Just make all of your movements on the rudders as small as they can be. Because uh, the bigger movements you put on the rudders, it's going to make the whole thing less smooth. And again, this lack of smoothness is going to disturb everything, slowing you down, making it more likely that you're going to stick the nose in. So I hope that helps there, Pylox17. Um, there are a great many things which can cause the bows to go down, but I think those are the most important ones. The last one, perhaps, is what about your boat setup? What is your mast rake setting? Perhaps your mast might be a little bit too far upright, too far to the front, which if it is, it means the boat is going to be much more likely to want to stick the nose in. There we go. All right. So I hope that helps. So Matt just says, just to finish off with the custom T-shirt thing, he says, I wasn't cool at all previously, but with the new T-shirt, he's 3% cooler. That is great. All right, Christian says, chatamaran. There we are. Uh, there's a word I haven't heard before. These days I'm saying, oh, yes, every time I throw a ball for the dog. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. All right, glad to help. All right, another preloaded question. At this time, if we can have no further questions in the live chat, because we've been going over an hour now, and it is after nine o'clock in the evening here, and I need a beer, which Philip has just bought for me. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, yes, Philip has used a super sticker 
this is a good way of just letting me know that the information or even just the entertainment that you're getting here is valuable. So uh, super sticker, the button is located just underneath the live chat. Um, thanks very much, Philip. Um, so next preloaded question. All right, I've still got a few preloaded questions. So really no more questions in the live chat, please. So this is from Zach. I think Zach might even be with us in the live or is that a different Zach? Either way. This is about um, diamond wires on the um, Hobie 18. So um, I won't go into too much detail about what diamond wires are, but he's saying where on the diamond wires do you put your loose gauge? Now, a loose gauge is a rig tension gauge. If you sail a boat like um like the BIM Air 16 or an F18, anything that sails with a tight rig, Hobie 18 with diamond wires, it is well worth investing in a loose gauge. Uh, this these cost about 130 euros, and it's the best rig tension gauge you can get. Um, it just tells you how tight the wires are. You clip it on and it tells you. I won't demonstrate it just here because I haven't got any wires. But um, where should you put it on your diamond wires? What I would generally do is boat on the beach, stand on the front beam, and then put it about at eye level. Because at eye level, you can read what it says. If you put it too high up, you can't read what it says. But most important thing is that every time you check your rig tension, you're doing it in the same place. Because what this is telling you is if your tension of your wires has changed at all. And if you're putting it in the same place every time, then that means that you're making an accurate test. Whereas if you're changing it every time, then who knows? Perhaps it's worth experimenting with different positions on the wire to see what differences it is. But with the diamond wires, especially, if you put your rig tension gauge too low down, then the wire is going to be really tight because it's really close to the turnbuckle or um, bottle screw where it's been anchored. So put it up, stand on the front beam, eye level uh, to read the numbers. And that is what I would say on that one. All right. The next question is from Second Mouse Gets the Cheese. Uh, uh, that is actually Bill from Haraki, Huraki Gulf, New Zealand. Um, he says, I'm a lightweight Hobie 14 sailor. I was recently giz given a Hobie 17. Really nice boat. Loves it. But he's not confident to sail it with its big mast, big sails, and would like to get smaller mast and sails. Um, is there a way of putting a Hobie 14 mast on a Hobie 17? Well, I can tell you something for free. I don't think it's ever been done. Um, so answer number one is not really, because like um, Bill says in his question, the mast bases on the two different types of mast are completely different. Now, to change either the mast base or the um, mast foot on the beam is going to be some quite intrusive surgery on the boat. So if you were willing to completely write off your Hobie 14 uh, mast to make it fit on that fitting, because on a 17 at the base, at the front beam, you've got a ball like this. And then on the bottom of the mast, it's kind of, that's your socket that sits on the ball. 
Whereas on the Hobie 14, this is the front beam. Front beam, it's the opposite. You've got like, what would you call that? Like a, a pool. Um, and then on the bottom of the mast, you've got the opposite part on there. So that's the mast base there. So they are completely as like the opposites of each other. So you could take the mast base off your Hobie 14 mast, find a ball type mast base that fits that section of mast. That would be probably the only way of doing it. But the other potential solution, although maybe quite hard to come by in New Zealand, would be to get a mast off a less powerful boat um, which has the same mast base. The ones that spring to mind immediately would be like a Hobie 15 that has this style of mast base. Um, probably the Hobie Getaway, I'm guessing. Um, something like the Hobie Twixie. Um, these all have less powerful sails, but with this style of mast base. Having done that, if you were to do that, what you'd have to do next is you would have to get some rigging to hold the mast up custom made because the rigging, the Hobie 17 is going to be much wider than these smaller boats, which means you're going to need longer rigging. Now, one problem that will arise, it's quite easy to overcome though, is that when you're putting a smaller rig on a bigger boat, Sorry, it doesn't really look like a Hobie 17 much, but um, what will happen, this is an exaggeration, is the sail is going to be much too short in the foot, which means if you were to just put the main sheet on from there, oh my days, what is going on here? Um, that is not going to work at all. So, you know, you may think, all right, so it's not going to happen. Well, it could still happen. What you would need to do is you'd need to somehow make a boom for that sail. So you put the boom on the sail. The boom needs to come back as far as the back beam. We have to make sure it's tied tight around the boom and the clue. And then we can use the main sheet from there. It's going to, it's going to look pretty weird. So there we go. That is what I would say on that as a topic. But probably a better idea, rather than changing the mast, is just trying the Hobie 17 mast with a smaller sail, you'll, you'll just need to work out how you're going to keep the mark, the sail in the up position. Um, you'll have to come up with some sort of scheme to hold the sail up. But um, I would say that would be a better choice. In fact, I could tell you how you hold the sail up. Here we go. You're getting all of the good stuff today, by the way, um, everybody. I hope you are finding this good stuff good because this is the good stuff that you, I don't think you'll get this sort of good stuff anywhere else. Um, let's see, how are we going to draw this? So if this is the mast, this can be applied to any type of boat, by the way. And at the top of the mast, we've got our hook. And then that hook needs to locate onto a ring. When I say what we're going to do, you're going to go, oh, that was actually very obvious. So we've got the ring, which is on the halyard. And let's have it in the hooked in position. But here's the thing. We're not going to shackle the ring straight onto the sail. What we're going to do 
with a different color is have a length of very high quality rope like some sort of rope with a dyneema core so it doesn't stretch it definitely won't break um and then that this is an exaggeration of course will then be tied to the top of the sail and there's our really long boom so we could put the main sheet on there we go there's the solution thanks very much for the question there phil uh bill sorry um all right and i'm not going to go into bill's second part of the question just now uh perhaps we'll keep that um in the wings for next week but the final question for today comes from Stefan, who was in the live chat earlier. I don't know if he's still there. Um, but Stefan was featured in the What Went Wrong video that went out last Sunday. It was Stefan who was on the Hobie 20 uh, with the wings. And in the video, I said that after a capsize, to, to make sure that the boat isn't going to sail off afterwards. You don't let the traveler off completely. Um, so quite a big concern for people who sail, especially on the bigger boats, like the 20 footers or the, the 18s, is that after bringing the boat up after a capsize, the boat can start moving forwards which makes it extremely difficult to get back onto the boat. So here's what we're talking about is we're looking from above at the boat and let's say after you brought your boat up from capsized, the wind is just blowing straight onto the front of the boat. Nice. All right. I think it's reasonably obvious that if there is any tension in the jib, then this is going to um, make the boat. In fact, we'll stick with red because red is what we don't want. This is going to make the boat turn away from the wind. And when it turns away from the wind, it's going to start to go forwards hmm. when it starts to go forwards very difficult to get back on now if there's any tension in the mainsail although having tension in the mainsail is going to make it perhaps more difficult uh, not more difficult but more likely to flip over the other way when we bring the boat up from capsized but that tension in the mainsail is going to bring the boat up. Well, it's going to bring the boat up into the wind. Granted, the wind here is in this direction. But that is going to stop the boat from going forwards. That's going to put the boat into the wind or hold it into the wind, which is going to make it easier for you to get back on. But of course, we don't want to bring the boat up right with the main sheet in because that would be like asking for a boat to flip over the other way when we write the boat so instead what we want to do is not let the traveler out more than about halfway you could try not letting the traveler out at all and just having your main sheet very loose because it's when you let the traveler out and the main sheet out that is when there's absolutely no pressure at all in the main, which means if there's anything at all in the jib, or even if you haven't got a jib, what's going to happen is as soon as the boat isn't perfectly into the wind, and let's face it, it's not going to stay there for long. So as soon as the wind starts coming, more from there the wind's going to hit this bit of the bow and what's going to happen yes 
we're going to turn off the wind and start sailing. So what we want is enough main sheet, just enough pull in the main sheet, which means if the boat does start going, the leech of the mainsail will catch and bring the boat back up into the wind. And what that will also do is when that catches, it will automatically get the rudders to go to the right side up into the wind and then you can get on. So that is why I'm suggesting um, with the bigger boats, um, although the Hobie 20 doesn't have a self-tacking jib, it's still in that category. But definitely anything with a self-tacking jib, don't let the main shape, main shape and the traveller all the way off before you bring the boat upright. There we go. All right. And then I believe that is um, thanks very much, Stefan, for the super sticker. Um, I hope that was a good explanation of what you should do, um, why you should do it, in fact. All right. Oh, yeah. So there's um, Zach is in the um, live chat. I hope that was um, that was helpful, Zach, as well. Philip says put a reef in your mainsail or get a sail off, put one in for you. Yes. So we're back to the um, reducing your sail area on your Hobie 17. Good plan. Ryan is still here, by the way, everybody, um, in case anybody was concerned. Ryan actually took me to work on the road and he's putting new diamond wires in tomorrow on the NACRA 500. Do I need a tension guide or is there a common method without the gauge? Mm. Yeah, it is diamond wires. I, I would say it is worth, because you're obviously into the sailing a lot. I would say get a gauge, get a gauge. Um, because otherwise with the diamond wires, especially, it's very difficult to know where it is that you stand. Uh, Joachim says steel or aluminium road trailer. I believe the standard is steel um, because aluminium, although it's very lightweight, I don't think has the strength of the steel. But um, the aluminium is very much standard. All right. Thanks very much to Christian for the super sticker. That's another beer for me tonight. Uh, no, not actually. All the super. The proceeds from the super stickers will all be going into the production of high quality videos on Joyrider TV. Yeah, that's right. I've got to save up at the moment for a new computer because my vintage 2013 MacBook Pro is on its last legs. It complains to me quite a lot whenever I try to do anything um, at all these days, in fact. So there we go. So um, Stefan says, waiting for our Canadian snow to melt. So that's Stefan, who I was that the same Stefan. Oh, I'm confused now. I only wrote Stefan in the um, in the preloaded. So I'm thinking this is probably the same Stefan. So hope that answer was up to speed. And thanks, Stefan, very much for the super sticker. I appreciate it very much. All right, we've got Chip on board from Whirlwind Sales. So um, someone's online on in the chat who's ordered his Whirlwind Sales, but I don't think they've arrived yet. Who was that? Oh, that was Philip. All right, so, um, so uh, he says, Chip says, as for the Hobie 17 mast, they are all comp tips. And only the top 12 inches are reinforced with an aluminium insert. Reef location or shorter luff needs to stop at the hounds. All right. So if with the Hobie 17, just to um, make this um, sound a bit more obvious. Sorry, Chip, I, that was pretty obvious, but... Um, because the Hobie 17 has got the comp tip mast, this is the hounds where the rigging attaches. If you're putting on a smaller sail, 
it has to stop here or I'm feeling lower down. But you can't have it stop here. So, sorry, what does it say? Um, only the top 12 inches. So if it's not all the way to the top, it can't be any higher up than the hounds. There you go. Thanks for that, Chip. I very much appreciate your input. All right, we've got Mishi on board. Hello, Mishi. Do you think a Hobie Tiger is a good choice for an experienced monohole sailor who hasn't got much cat experience? Yes, I do. If you're an experienced monohole sailor, to go onto a catamaran, pretty much any type of catamaran, you should feel quite comfortable. Transitioning from a mono to a catamaran is much easier than going the other way. So I would say yes. Now, the only thing you'd want to keep in mind if you're transitioning from a mono to a cat, especially something relatively powerful like a Tiger or an F-18, is for your first couple of times out on the boat, just don't go out in too much wind. Have like a 12 knot wind limit uh, for how much to go out in. Because if you go out in more, you might find it all gets away from you a little bit. And if you capsize a boat like this, which has got mylar sails, especially if it's a bit older, you might actually go through the sail, which would be really upsetting. All right, Philip says, hi, Chip. Okay, um, it's always good to put um, sail makers and people uh, who have put in an order with that sail maker together on Joyrider TV. All right, Cuxolly in with a super sticker. Thanks very much, Cuxolly. Um, very uh, generous of you. And yes, this new computer is feeling that much closer already. So thanks very much. All right. That is the same Stefan, incidentally. Um, all right. Jurkin says, before I got the gauge and I settled the diamond wires just by eye, it was the bend and then got the gauge and it was bang on. Yeah. So, yeah, in fact, it's the same as what I used to do as well before using the gauge is um, what I would do. It's kind of like doing from having the gauge, it's all a bit backwards. But if this was the mast, we have set our diamond wires to the manufacturer's recommendation. And then the manufacturer would always also recommend an amount of pre-bend. So we've got the mast. There's our diamond wires there, our spreaders there. And what we would do is take the main halyard from the top and we place it just above the boom on the gooseneck fitting. And then what we'd be looking for when we've achieved the correct amount of tension in the diamond wires, this was back in the day on the Hobie Tiger, no gauge, would be when we measure from the trailing edge of the mast to this straight line, which is the main halyard, so it's under a lot of tension, is two and a half centimetres. So we're looking for two and a half centimetres of pre-bend on that type of boat. All right, Chip says, um, we're still on the reefing sails. He said any type of comp tip mast that it only has the top 12 inches, which are reinforced to take the sail, the top of the sail. So unless the sail's at the top, um, if you're reefing, the top of the sail doesn't want to go any higher up than the hounds. There we go. All right, so Joachim says, apply some tension, make sure it's straight laterally and then some reasonable bend. If you can't flatten the mainsail, you're lacking bend. If it goes beyond flat, then it's too tight. 
I nailed it in the first go without uh, being used to see the proper bend. But I think the gauge is still worth it for the rest of the rigging, which is hard to get right by eye. Yeah, having a gauge just means there's no guesswork involved. All you need to do is use the gauge. It will tell you if you're in the sweet spot and then off you go. And on that note, saying off you go, I think off I go. Uh, we've been going for an hour and a half now. It is definitely time for a beer. So thanks to everybody for tuning in live. Thanks to everybody who's watched until the end later on. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, answering your questions today. Thanks to everybody for the super stickers. I really appreciate that. Uh, get over to totaljoyrider.com and see what's fresh in there. And I will be back soon with some more. As always, I am going to try to put a new events video out for this Sunday, but with the workload at work, I'm not sure when I'm going to get the time to do that. All right. Thanks very much, guys. And I'll see you soon.